Good evening, Periscope folks, and there's Facebook. Good evening, about Periscope and Facebook, Prof. David Taylor here for my second Thursday teaching <clears throat> entitled No More Genies. This is part three of my latest series. This is not part three of No More Genies in total, but this is part three of my latest series. My latest series is entitled uh, We Do It Wrong, and so I would highly recommend that you so trying to get everything situated here. Sorry about that. Sorry about the fingers all over the screen. I would recommend that you uh, watch everything from the beginning so that you can uh, get the full understanding of what I'm talking about um, because there's a lot of stuff I have to cover. But basically in my series that I'm doing now entitled We Do It Wrong, I'm talking about so many of the incorrect messages and incorrect ideas and incorrect things that have been communicated in a lot of our religious backgrounds. And then we wonder why we don't have the power in the body of Christ like we're supposed to. And then we wonder why we don't have the, uh, the same results like you see in the Bible. We wonder a whole bunch of things. Well, that's because there's so many things that we have believed and taught that are just not biblical. Okay, and a whole lot of things we're just doing it wrong. So that's what this series is about. So I strongly encourage you to go back. It's one, two, and three. And like I said, definitely, um, definitely uh, start from the beginning so you can understand because I break it all down in detail um, because... We're going to jump in. I'm going to pick up where I left off last time. So you definitely have to watch the whole series to understand everything I'm saying in context. Okay? All right, let's have a word of prayer, and then we're going to jump right in. Father, in the name of Jesus, I come to you thanking you for an opportunity to come into your throne room by faith. We have access to you by this grace in which we stand because of Jesus and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. So God, we just bless your name. We bless your name. We honor you. We magnify you. Reverence to your name. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So I surrender to your will right now. Not my will, but thy be done. So fill me with the Holy Ghost. Fill my mind, my heart, my eyes, my, my mouth, my brain, everything, so that you can speak through me, oh God, so that you can use me, so that what you want said is said tonight, so that you might be glorified in all things that the people might be edified and the demons might be terrified and all those that don't believe in you might be challenged to believe in you by the word that comes forth tonight. And I thank you for it and I believe you for it and we give you all the glory because without you, we can do nothing. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, amen and amen. So this is part three of No More Genies. And remember my No More Genies series in general is talking about getting rid of a genie concept of God. Because God is not magic, <laughs> and faith is not magic, and the Bible is not magic. That's not what it says. That's not how it works. And so this particular series, uh, we've been talking about what Jesus actually preached. What we preach is get saved, get saved, born again, born again, miss hell, miss hell, go to church, go to church, go to heaven when you die. That's not what the Lord preached. The Lord preached the kingdom. The kingdom of God is like this. The kingdom of God is like that. The kingdom of heaven is like this. The kingdom of heaven is like that. So we're supposed to be preaching and teaching what the Lord preached and taught. Okay? Because we preach what we call the gospel of Jesus Christ, but we don't preach the gospel that Jesus Christ preached. And he preached the kingdom. So what I've been doing is we've been going through uh, the different parables and teachings of Jesus on the kingdom and breaking them down. And once we get into them, you'll see some stuff you haven't seen before. And it'll answer a lot of your questions. It'll explain a lot of things to you about life, about people, about God, about the kingdom, about how the word works. If we would just preach and teach what Jesus preached and taught. Okay. So tonight we're going to look at the parable of the wheat and the tares. And again, we're going to go to Matthew. <clears throat> now, the parables are found in more than one place in Matthew, but I like reading them out of Matthew. Okay, so this is called in some translation the parable of the wheat and the tares. Some people call it the parable of the weeds. It's in Matthew chapter 13, and we're going to start at verse 24. It's going to be 24 through 30, so six verses. 
Matthew 24 through, excuse me, Matthew chapter 13, I'm sorry. Matthew chapter 13, verse 24 through 30. The parable of the weeds or the parable of the wheat and the tares. Okay, and I'm reading out of the NIV version. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, Do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you are pulling the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned. Then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. Oh, Lord, there's a whole lot to unpack in there. But I'm going to answer the main question that you have, because I already know what the main question is that you have. And the main question that you have is, why in the world would the Lord let the enemy sow tares or weeds among the wheat? If the Lord knows that the devil did that, and that's of the devil, and then they say, do you want us to pull them up? And the Lord's like, no. Why? Why would God allow the tares slash weeds to grow with the wheat? Okay? There's more than one reason why, but I'll give you a few. One of the main reasons God allows stuff like that to happen is because it gives tares or weeds or people that are like that, it gives them a chance. Because you don't have any excuse if you grew up among the saints. Do you ever think about that? Do you ever think about people that grew up around the word of God, that grew up around the saints, that grew up in church, and they still turn out to be weeds anyway? That means you have no excuse. It's different from somebody that was never exposed to the word and never exposed to the kingdom and never exposed to church or anything like that. But if you grew up around that, the Lord allows that to happen because he gives you a chance. Okay? That's why sinners aren't going to be able to make any excuses before God. When they stand before God, talking about they didn't know. Yes, you did know. If you grew up around the wheat, yes, you did know. If you grew up around the word, yes, you did know. You just have the devil in your heart. Okay, that's number one. Number two, God allows that because, hey, how are you? Because God t uses that to test his people. Because mm -hmm. many times people that ain't right will test you. And what a lot of people don't understand about testing is testing is not designed to destroy you. That's temptation. That's the devil. And the Bible says clearly that God does not tempt us. God does not tempt any man. Neither can God be tempted by evil. In other words, God has no desire for evil. Evil doesn't have any appeal to God. If you put evil in front of God, he don't want it. That's temptation. That's the devil. But God will test you. But the reason that God tests you is not to destroy you. The reason that God tests you is to bring the best out of you. Because the best out of you only comes through testing. It can't come any other way. It's the same way you build muscle. The only possible way you build muscle is through resistance. Okay? So you've got to tear those muscles down by using them against something that's stronger than you are right now. And when those muscles rebuild, they rebuild stronger, and that's how you gain muscle mass. Okay? And so, reason number two, God allows that to happen because God will use them people to test you. Because if you save and you want to be saved, don't nothing test you like a bunch of phony people to look like they say, but they're not. Ha! Ha ha! Okay? That's number two. Number three, when he talks about let them grow together to the harvest, to the proper time. At that time, I'll tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds. I'll stop by to tell you what a lot of unbelievers don't know is that God keeps records. If you know the Lord and you know the scriptures, you know that about God. But if you don't know the Lord and you don't know the Bible, you don't understand that God has detailed records about the minutia of your life. And when I say minutia, I mean like the number of cells in your body, like how many cells you lose in a day and how many grow back. And if you got hair on your head, how much hair you got on your head. And they're not counted, they're numbered. So God actually has a number for all of the hairs on your body, your mitochondria, <laughs> how long you're going to live, every word you say, every beat of your heart, every word in your tongue, every thought in your brain, God actually writes that down. And if you don't know the Lord, you don't know that. And so when God allows stuff like this to happen, it's so that when he judges, he will have a record that you cannot argue with. How are you going to argue with a record? 
Many times people don't understand that's why God allows things to happen because everybody thinks that the Lord should stop certain things from happening. But the Lord is the righteous judge. And when the season of judgment comes, you know, the Lord is always going to judge you based on your record. This is what people don't understand. The Lord is going to judge you based on what you say and do. And he's going to judge you based on your motives, the thoughts in your heart, why you do what you do. Because he has records of all that. And when the, when the time comes, when that season comes, and I'm not talking about final judgment at the end of the age. I'm talking about a season of judgment in your life. Because there's seasons of judgment individually, and then for families, and then for ethnic groups of people, and then for regions, and then for nations. And then the book of Revelation talks about the final judgment on the earth. But people don't understand. It's not always like it was in the days of Noah, where God floods the whole earth, or the book of Revelation where God ends the whole earth. There are seasons of judgment on every level that we exist. When your season of judgment comes, the Lord's going to come with his records. He lets you grow up. <laughs> and he's going to come with his records of what you said and did and why you said it and why you did it. And what are you going to be able to say? How can you refute that when it's written? Or if he has a video. Because remember, God doesn't just see out here. That's us. God sees in here. God has x-ray vision. God can see the spirit. And your heart and everything that's in the breath of life in you, God can see that just as plain as day because he made it. You see that? So that's, you know, three of the main reasons that the Lord allows stuff like that to happen, because a lot of people feel like that it shouldn't be that way. But the Lord says the kingdom of heaven is like this. OK, so I just gave you three of the main reasons why. Now we're going to go back and look at the scripture a little bit more closely. Jesus told him another parable. Now, remember, I explained to you, I'm, I'm back in verse 24, Matthew 13, 24. Remember, I explained to you that the reason, or one of the reasons that the Lord uh, ministered in parables is because stories, parables, analogies uh, are timeless. And the Lord knew that his word was going to go forth for the rest of the age. So many times the Lord taught in parables, because so, when you tell it in story form or parable form, parable form, that can last throughout the ages. Because there's no culture on earth that doesn't other understand harvest. Because we couldn't have any food if we didn't understand harvest. There's no culture that doesn't have words for seed or weeds or, or harvest all that. See that? Because stuff like that is timeless. And it's, 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 uh, it's cross-cultural. You know, everybody can understand it. So Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven, there's his true message. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. Stop. The seed of the word of God is good. And if you are a Christian, God believes in you because the nature of Christ is on the inside of you. That's what happened the day you got saved or the day you got born again, is that your spirit got recreated with the, the nature of Christ on the inside, of it, but you were a baby spiritually. But God sees you if you're saved, the Father God sees you through the eyes of Christ. Okay? That means he believes in us. That means he believes in our potential. That means that, that he sees the best in you. Okay? And I've discovered a lot of saints don't know that either. <laughs> so he sowed good seed in his field, but while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. Now you need to understand something about that word, uh, weeds. In the Bible, in your uh, Strong's Concordance, it's 2215. It's called zizania, okay? And that word means darnel or false grain. What is darnel? Okay, darnel is a kind of a plant that looks like uh, wheat when it first sprouts, but it's actually a weed. It's a weed that looks like wheat when it first sprouts, but it's actually uh, a weed. It's not wheat, okay? And um, so it looks, it can be very, very deceptive because when it first buds, it looks like wheat. And that's really, really, really important. And let me say, while I'm on this, that, you know, many times when you see these, these so-called scandals or these things going on in church and stuff like that and people saying this and people saying that, you know, I generally don't get involved in stuff like that because I'm trying to stay focused on what the Lord wants me to do. 
But what I will say is that this is all a part of the game. Okay? There's all kinds of people in the world and all kinds of people in God's kingdom. So where we got that idea that, that everything, that everybody was, you know, a, a wheat and some people weren't weeds or tares or a whole bunch of things, all that, that's not in the Bible. Okay? That's not in the Bible. That wasn't even true in Jesus' circle because Jesus had a circle of 12 that he handpicked and inside that 12, he had three that he was closer to, Peter, James, and John. And then he had one of them that betrayed him, which was Judas. But one of his best friends, Peter, denied him and began to curse and swear when he got under pressure to act like he didn't even know the Lord. If that happened to Jesus, why are you surprised? <laughs> if that happened to Jesus, why are you surprised? Hmm? Okay. So, you know, I'm just saying that to say, don't let your heart be troubled by stuff that you hear or whatever, you just stay focused on what the Lord wants you to do. You just ask God to give you a clean heart. You just ask God to, to help you stay right with him because that's all you have to worry about is did I do what the Lord wanted me to do? And you have to worry about the rest. You don't have to worry about who's saved and who ain't right and this and the Bible. You don't have to worry about none of that. That's a bunch of noise. I'm just saying stuff like that is going to happen, but you as an individual Christian do not have to worry about that. Your thing is, am I doing what the Lord told me to do? Is my focus on Christ and what Christ wants me to do in my life? Because that's how he's going to judge you. Remember I told you earlier that he keeps detailed records of everything you say and do. He has detailed records of the minutia of your life. So when you meet the Lord, the Lord is always going to meet you with his records of what you did and said and why you did it. So why in the world would you be worried about what other people are doing? That doesn't even make any sense. You don't have to answer for them. You got to answer for you. Understand? All right. So, so again, um, uh, while everyone, verse 25, while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds. And again, that word is darnel. It's a false grain. When it sprouts, it says, when the weed sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. That weed, that darnel, that false grain, looks like weed at first when it buds, but it's actually a weed. Okay? So, he says, the owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? He said, an enemy did this. Oh, Lord. Now, that word enemy there uh, has a bunch of different meanings, but one of the meanings is adversary. Now, if you didn't know, the name Satan means adversary. So the Lord says an enemy did this, an adversary did this, that's the devil, okay? And so there are definitely some people like Judas was in Jesus' 12 that are sold into the kingdom of heaven by the devil. Boom, I know your mind just exploded. People that, that come from the devil, ain't right or whatever, trying to mix in with the saints, Trying to mix in and grow up and look like a Christian, look like a wheat, look like all that while they're growing up. And the devil plants them, the Lord said, while everybody's sleeping. And so that's why many times people don't understand why there's, you know, sometimes confusion or ugliness or some of the things that happen in a congregation. Because you think everybody there is wheat. No, they not. The Lord just told you that they not. <laughs> the Lord just told you that the devil makes a point of sowing some weeds among the wheat while everybody sleep. And then when when things start to grow, when things start to come up, then them weeds that look like wheat at first, but then it turns out they're actually weeds. Okay? And so the Lord says, the devil did that, adversaries do that. The servants asked him, do you want us to go and pull them up? He said, no, because while you are pulling the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned, and then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. Okay, that, them verses are deep. they deeper than you think they are. So the Lord said, no, he answered, because while you're pulling the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. Do you know partially what that's talking about? That's talking about judgment and destruction. Okay, when, when the servants... Ask Jesus, the servants, the owner servants, he's talking about angels. Okay? 
So the Lord is saying that if if the Lord just released angels to just destroy something, they might destroy us. And uh, unless, you know, he separates us out first. And what I mean by that is that if judgment is going to fall on a city, in a city there will always be righteous and wicked people. The best example I can give you of this is Sodom and Gomorrah. Because Sodom and Gomorrah in the Old Testament was slated for judgment. Um, because they were not living right in the eyes of God. They were living carnally. They were living wild. They were completely out of control. They had no standards, no boundaries. They sleep with anybody. They rape anybody. They, they were living like animals. And God was going to destroy that city. But then Abraham intervened and interceded with God. And God said if he found, he started with... Uh, I believe it was 20 righteous people or 25. I don't remember. I have to look the story up. But anyway, Abraham bargained God down to five righteous people. He, he interceded and got God to agree and asked the Lord for his mercy and said, if you can just find five righteous people, will you not destroy the city? And he could not find five righteous people in Sodom and Gomorrah. So he sent angels to destroy it. But what did they do? They got Lot and his family out first. That's an example of this. That's when judgment and destruction is coming, it's the saints of God that hold it back. And God is not going to destroy a situation or city and all that and leave us in it. He's going to separate the wheat from the tares or the wheat from the weed so that when all the destruction is falling, it don't fall on the actual wheat, the actual believers. That's how deep this is. So he says that both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters. That's what I meant when I said earlier that there are seasons of judgment. But there are seasons of judgment on every level that people exist on. There's individual judgment. There's judgment on families. There's judgment on neighborhoods. There's judgment on cities. There's judgments on ethnic groups of people. There's judgment on states and regions. There's judgments on nations. And then there's global judgment on the whole earth. And one example, like I said before, of global judgment is Noah. When God flooded the whole earth and wiped everything out down to one family. But many times when people think of the judgment of God, they think about it on a grander scale, like the global judgment of Noah, or like when God judged Egypt to deliver the children of Israel from Egypt, when God judged Pharaoh and sent the ten plagues of Egypt. And each one of the plagues was designed to uh, put down and refute and show dominance over one of the false gods that the Egyptians worked, uh, worshipped. That's why the plagues were what they were. So every play that God sent against Egypt, he was putting down, he was putting his foot on one of the false gods that the Egyptians worshipped. So many times people think of judgment, they think, they think of that like that. But there's individual judgment in your life. So in other words, you're going to hit points in your life where time is up. What do I mean by that? I mean, because you hear me say it all the time. Whatever God wanted you to accomplish for that season, time's up. You, you, you had all the time God is going to give you, and then he's going to come judge you. Okay? If you did what you were supposed to do and got your assignments completed on time, and you're in sync and in step, and you did what God wanted, then you'll get a well done. If the Lord comes to judge you and your work isn't finished, or you took what he gave you and buried it, like in the parable of the talents, we'll get to that later, where you didn't do anything with what God gave you and you just sat on it, the Lord calls that wicked and lazy. And the judgment there is God is going to take what he gave you and give it to somebody that's being fruitful and productive. That happened in the Bible too. That happened with King Saul and King David. So that's what I mean when I say you have to understand that when you read a parable about like this, this is not just talking about the big, explosive, fancy, you know, dramatic judgments like we see with the floodwaters of Noah or the burning of Sodom and Gomorrah or, you know, the major judgment at the end of the world, or, okay, it, it's talking about a season of judgment, which is going to come for you individually. You heard me say it earlier, uh, because the Holy Ghost gave a prophetic word about, there's some things we need to get done for the summer. So we are already in August 8th. That means when August 31st hits, there's certain things we need to have done. Because when September hits, there's going to be a whole new everything. Whole new word, whole new prophetics, a whole new season. So you need to get your summer work done while it's summer. That's what I'm trying to say. And then sometimes, some saints just don't make the cut. Sometimes, some saints just don't make the cut. Sometimes their time is up and they die. 
Sometimes whatever it was God wanted them to do or whatever it was God had in their life, or whatever season they was in, they hit that cutoff point and they leave. They don't get to hang around for another season. Sometimes the judgment is, if the judgment is negative, because remember, if you do what you're supposed to do, you're going to get a well done. Thou good and faithful servant, enter, to, enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. And what that means is that God's going to take you to the next level. God's going to, if you master what the Lord wanted you to master in that season on that level, he's going to bless you and take you to the next level and give you more. More grace, more anointing, more prosperity, more wealth, more relationships, more influence. He's going to increase you if you pass your tests. But sometimes if you don't pass your test, especially if you've been walking in unbelief, sometimes when God comes to judge, he will consign you to the wilderness. Oh, my goodness. And you will never make it into the promised land. What do I mean by that and what does that look like? What I mean is, just like in the scripture, that first generation that came out of Egypt under Moses, they got to the edge of the promised land, the land that God wanted them to take and possess and own and told them they could, he was going to be with them to kick out the people that were currently in the land. And they were going to take it over. And it was a land flowing with milk and honey and big bunches of grapes and raisins. And they would never be slaves again. And they would never lack again. And it was going to be great. And they got to the edge of the promised land. And they did not believe God. And that was the 10th time they had tested God like that with their unbelief. And God said, all right, that's it. He, he drew the line. And he said that generation was going to wander in the wilderness till they died. And God was going to take the children in, everybody under the age of 21, except for Joshua and Caleb, because Joshua and Caleb believed God. So they got to go in. But it was 40 years later because they wandered in the wilderness 40 years until they die, till they die. What does that look like in practical real life? That's people when you meet people and they just been wandered in the same circles for decades and they say they're Christians, but they don't grow. They sing in the same songs. They haven't added anything new to their testimony. They're still complaining about the same things. They just wander in their circles. They just wander in their circles till they die. That's wilderness living. That's not the life that God has for us. God has promised land living life for us. God has Canaan life for us in this life where we can take the promised land. We can live our dreams. We can have the desires of our heart. We don't have to worry about provision where we can be as fruitful as possible where we can take as much land as we can while we live. That's what God has for us in his life. And if you don't believe that, the Lord might show up one day in your life and consign you to the wilderness and you just wander until you die. Nothing's going to change. There's not going to be anything new. Nothing's going to be fresh. And 30 or 40 years from now, if you live that long, you're still going to be singing the same songs, giving the same testimony. And if you've ever been around dull, dead, dry churches, you've seen what I'm talking about. They still back somewhere stuck in the 80s, back somewhere stuck in the 90s, back somewhere that the Lord isn't anymore. He's in 2019 doing what he's doing, trying to accomplish here. You see that? That happens to far more Christians than you think, where they just don't believe God has more for them in this life. And if you tell God that you don't want to go forward, he might show up when it's time to judge you and just make you wander till you die. That's wilderness, level, that's wilderness living. Those are called wilderness Christians. And God allows us to see them for a, a negative example. In other words, God is saying, don't be like that. Don't disbelieve me so much till you push me to the point where I consign you to the wilderness because then you're just going to wander till you die. You're going to never see the promised land. You might live long enough to see your children grow up to do what you were supposed to do. You might live long enough to see your children inherit what you were supposed to inherit. Mm, that's not the way to live and that's not the way to die. The way to live is to follow Christ into your dreams, into the fullness of the promises he has for you, into the fullness of his kingdom, which is why I keep telling you, we're supposed to preach and teach the kingdom. Okay, we're supposed to preach and teach the kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, because we don't want to have that kind of, of judgment on our lives. We want to follow Christ all the way. We want to get the full, the fullness. Do you know why? Why in the world would Jesus go through that kind of a brutal death if he didn't want you to have exactly what he says in John 10.10, 10, which is life and life more abundantly, life in fullest measure. If you get behind there in the Greek, that word says bursting, bursting with life, bursting so much you can't contain it. 
uh, life just, you know, springing forth, just bubbling up. That's the kind of life the Lord wants you to have. And that's the kind of life that he died for you to have. And if you tell God no, then when the season of judgment comes, why do you think sometimes so many saints just drop dead? Okay, that's like Ananias and Sapphira. They lied to the Holy Ghost. You know, whatever you playing games with God, you ain't being real with God. God is not playing games with you. If you think your relationship with God is some kind of joke or some type of game, you are in for a rude awakening because that is not the truth. Because Father invested the life of his son into you. The son invested literally his life's blood into you. And then he sent the Holy Spirit and the Spirit of God to invest himself in us every day. He gives us gifts, grace, anointing, wisdom, insight, word of knowledge, uh, healing, uh, uh, power of deliverance through Jesus' name to cast out demons. Uh, the apostolic, the prophetic. How much does the Holy Ghost give us every day? You know why he does that? Because he wants us to grow and become all that we're supposed to be in Christ. That's why Jesus uses so many parables that have to do with living organisms, with live things that grow. Because he's trying to show us the analogy of what our lives are like and what his kingdom is like. So it says, let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters... First, collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned. Then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. Okay. You need to understand that if you are a believer, at some point in your life, there's going to be some separation. Good gravy from the Navy. I know we don't like it. I know we don't always understand it. But the Lord just told you that there is going to, when harvest season comes, until the harvest there's going to be a time where God comes back and looks on what he sowed and he's going to take the weed out. He wants the productive part. He don't want the weeds. He don't want the people that just look, look saved on the surface, but they're really weeds from the devil. That's not coming in. Okay? So the Lord says, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned. There's going to be a separation. Now, some are in a practical sense, because you know, I always like to give practical examples. I don't ever want you to get hung up on a concept or a precept and you can't apply it to your life. In a practical sense, what that means is that you will have noticed, if you've been walking with the Lord for, I'll say, over two years, if you've been walking with Christ, you will start to notice that some people are just going to start to fall away from your life. And then some people are going to be antagonistic towards you. That's that weed stuff manifesting. Because they don't want nothing. They just look saved on the surface. They just look a certain way on the surface. But inside the substance is weed, they're tares, they're not wheat. And the Lord says there's going to come a time where he's going to collect the weeds that that stuff is going to be separated out from your life. Because there's some people you're going to have to leave behind. Don't you know that when God is ready to take you to the next level, that is going to bring a natural separation from you and some of the people you know, sometimes people you've known for a very long time. Do you know why? Because they do not believe God on that level. They're not going. So they're not going to be in your life anymore. What do I, I'll give you a practical example. If you're one of those Christians that don't believe in speaking in tongues and don't believe in the prophetic, and you're around a bunch of people that don't believe in speaking in tongues and don't believe in the prophetic, and then one day you get an anointing, one day you get an encounter, one day you get a revelation, one day you get a visitation from the Lord, and all of a sudden you get filled with the Holy Ghost and the tongues start to flow, and then your prophetic starts to flow, them same people, them same Christians that you hung with all that time, they're going to say, well, we don't believe in all that. Well, it don't take all that, and y'all going to separate. I've also found that there, if you're going particular places in the prophetic, because the prophetic man is deep and wide and high, <coughs> and when you read some of the prophets in the scripture, when you read some of the stuff they went through, and when you read some of the stuff they saw, Prophetic is something else. If you want to enter into the prophetic on that level, you're going to have to leave some people behind. Some people ain't coming with you because they don't want to go. They can't handle it. They don't want to believe God on that level, and they don't want to go through all that trouble. They don't want to fast. They don't want to pray. They don't want to develop a prayer language. They don't want to deal with demons. I personally know a whole lot of Christians that are just like that. They don't want to deal with deliverance. Deliverance is just as much a part of being a Christian as forgiveness of sin is. But if you notice, there are a lot of people that fracture the unity of Scripture and only talk about forgiveness of sin. As if 
Forgiveness of sin is all that God offered us in Christ. That is not all that Father God offered us in Jesus. That's the beginning. That's the foundation. That's one of the most beautiful parts about being saved is that the blood of Jesus has paid the price for your sin on Calvary's cross. But that's not all. God offers you deliverance. And deliverance is where you can get unclean spirits broke off your life in the name of Jesus and do the same thing in other people's lives where anything unclean, anything that's like a weed from the devil, anything that's bothering you, like if you have chronic headaches that you can't seem to get rid of, if you have something that seems to happen to you all the time in your life is negative and you don't know why, if you don't feel a sense of peace in your house, all them is unclean spirits. You don't have to live like that if you say. Mm-hmm. I did this. Uh, I did this thing one time. I'm not gonna tell you where it was. <laughs> there was someone I was working with, and they came to me and they said, "Mr. Taylor, I just get headaches all the time, and when I go in my room, I just feel like I want to kid my kill myself. I just feel all this negative energy, and I just feel suicidal, and and I get headaches, and I don't know what's wrong." And I said, "Okay, okay." I said, "Them is demons." So let me tell you exactly what to do. When you go back home and get to your room, put on some gospel music, put on some praise and worship. Fill your room, create an atmosphere of worship, and then say, in the name of Jesus, I command suicide, negativity, depression to get out of my room, get out of my life, get out of my space, and leave me alone in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. She did it and came back the next day, and her face was going. She said, Mr. Taylor, I did what you said, and I feel better, and she was happy and all that. And I said, mm-hmm. You know why? Because that's just as much a part of being a Christian as forgiveness of sin. But you know and I know that some folks that just preach forgiveness of sin as if that's all that God offered. God offered forgiveness of sin. God offered deliverance. God offered healing because healing is the children's bread. You don't have to stay sick. You don't have to be sick. You don't have to have chronic illnesses. You don't, you don't have to go through that. You don't have to leave here early because some sickness takes you out. You don't have to die because you get sick. When you die, you can die because your work is done. You can live and then you know, okay, well, I finished what I was supposed to do. Then you can go home. You don't have to get sick and die. A whole lot of people don't get sick and die. You don't have to get sick and die when you save if you listen to the Lord and you believe. But healing is a part of your inheritance as a Christian. Okay? So is the prophetic. The prophetic is just as much a part of your inheritance as a Christian as forgiveness of sin. There are so many benefits in the prophetic. You hear me talk about it all the time. That's why the devil hates the prophetic. One of the benefits of the prophetic is that you can see the devil coming. And the Lord will show you stuff prophetically before it happens. Why would you not want that advantage? That doesn't make any sense to me. <laughs> if the Lord is going to show you what the devil is going to do before he does it, if the Lord is going to show you things before they happen, if the Lord is going to tell you, don't drive down that street, because yes, the Holy Spirit will deal with you even on that level. If you feel the Holy Spirit just give you a sense of, eh, don't go that way. Listen to the Holy Ghost and drive the way the Holy Ghost is telling you to drive, because there was some kind of danger or something down that street that the Lord was trying to get you to avoid. Yes, God will deal with you on that level, and a lot of people don't believe that, but he will. He'll deal with you on any level of your life because the Lord loves you. And um, he gives us the prophetic so we can know things before they happen, so we can see them before they happen, so we can see movement in the spirit. whole lot of stuff. There's so many benefits to the prophetic. That's why the devil hates it. And it's for every Christian. It's not for certain denominations. Because all my life I've heard people say that we don't do that over here or that's just for certain people or that was just, you know, for Bible times and none of that is true. The whole Bible is prophetic. The entire Bible from Genesis to Revelation is prophetic and was written by apostles and prophets. So what you're talking about that we don't do that no more. So, that, so that's what I mean when I say if you are actually a wheat, a member of the kingdom of God, you have all these benefits and the Lord is going to separate the weeds out of your life so you can fully realize your benefits as a Christian. And when you get serious about your walk with Christ, then the Lord does a lot of pruning. He comes in your life and he said, the Lord said that he's divine and the father is the husbandman or the gardener, the master gardener. So what that means is that Jesus is divine, the main root, the main plant, and we're all branches coming out of Jesus. 
So Father God comes and examines our lives. And if he sees anything in our life that's unproductive or unfruitful, he'll prune it. He'll cut it out. He'll convict us. He'll tell us, get rid of that thing or get rid of that person or get rid of that habit or don't do that because that's not helping you be as productive as you need to be. Okay? And that's what happens when you begin to grow in Christ. That's a part of the process. Well, there are a whole lot of people who don't want to be bothered with that process. There's a whole lot of people who don't want to hear what the Lord has to say. So, like the Lord says, first collect the weeds. There's going to be a natural separation. So when you see sometimes people just leave a church, or when you see sometimes people just drop dead, or when you see sometimes people just exit out your life, let them go. They can't handle or they don't want to go to where God is taking you next. And here's how you know. If you explained it to them, they just look at you like you're crazy. <laughs> if you explain to some people, to some folks that are just fakers and shakers, what God was actually doing in your life, they would they just look at you like you're crazy. Like you're crazy. I uh, listed... Uh, on my Amazon page, I listed all the things that I do. I listed that I'm an author, I'm a prophet, I'm a songwriter, I'm a musician, you know, I'm a playwright, uh, and all that. And so I had somebody come up to me that knew me for a long time, and they said, prophet? What, what does that mean? What, what do you mean you're a prophet? And so I explained it to them, and then I told them about some judgments that were happening in America, and I told them about some stuff, and they just looked at me like, Mm -hmm. Okay, Dave, they looked at me like I lost my mind. They gave me that condescending look, like I was, you know, cuckoo for co Cocoa Puffs, and they were just condescendingly going to tolerate me because, you know, I, I obviously had gone off my rocker, they thought. Untrue. But they don't believe in the prophetic life like I do, and maybe they've never seen it before, and maybe they didn't want to hear it, I don't know. All I know is you can't tell me what I saw. You can tell me what you believe, but you can't tell me what I saw. You can't tell me what God showed me. You can't. Tell, how would you know what the Lord showed me? I'm not trying to tell you what God showed you. That ain't none of my business. And I don't, you know, I'm not in that. But you can't tell me what the Lord showed me. So if you don't believe it, then see what I mean? Because there's going to be that natural separation. So the Lord says here, you collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned. Their lives going to get burned up. That's another reason in Psalm 37, God says, to fret not ourselves because of evildoers. Neither be thou envious of the workers of iniquity, for they soon shall be cut down. Okay, let me read that to you. Psalm 37, because the Lord is talking about that very thing right here. Okay, and let me read out of the King James, because that's my favorite version of this scripture. Fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Do you see how many living analogies are in the Bible about what happens in our lives? So the Lord said, he's going to collect the weeds, tie them in bundles to be burned. Then he said, then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. Okay, that means there's going to be a time of separation. There's going to be a time of burning. And then there's going to be a time of gathering, a time of gathering. You will come to a point in your life where the Lord gathers you together with a bunch of other wheat. You will come to a point in your life because the Lord is going to want you to be around people that can help feed you and help you grow and all that. You will come to that point as you walk with Christ long enough. So you can't be surprised when you see all this other stuff happening because the Lord said his kingdom is like that. Because I know just to keep it practical, just to keep it real, I know that many of you listening to me have been in situations where you've been in churches and you met people that are just as full of the devil. <coughs> they so full of the devil, it's kind of shocking. It's like you meet them and you encounter them and you, and after a while you begin to see by the way they talk and the kind of stuff that they do, they just as full of the devil. They full of the devil in church, and people like that are the people that go to church every Sunday. Now, I don't mean everybody that goes to church every Sunday is full of the devil. I mean, people that are full of the devil are faithful. It's amazing, because they ain't going to miss a service. They're going to be there when the front door open. And, and, and you meet them, 
and it takes less than five minutes and you can't believe they're just as full of the devil. They're just as full of the devil and they in church every Sunday and 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 they always shouting and they always loud and they always amen pass it, blah, 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 at the top of their lungs and all that. And they just as full of the devil. And the first time you see that is that's shocking. But Jesus said his kingdom is like that. Jesus said that the enemy comes and plants some weeds, even though God is sowing good word and God is sowing good people. The Lord said in his kingdom, the devil tried to sneak in there and the devil plants some weeds and some tares. And the Lord said, let them grow for a while until harvest time. And I guarantee you when harvest time comes, them same folk, they're going to get exposed or they're going to get tied up and burned. They're going to be out the picture. But sometimes when you meet him, you're like, up in the house of God, just as full of the devil. But remember, that was Judas Iscariot. He was one of the twelve. And the Bible says clearly that the devil put it in his heart to betray Jesus. Just as full of the devil walking with Jesus. So the reason I'm laboring on that point is help, help you to understand to not be surprised when you see that. <laughs> because the Lord says the kingdom of heaven is like this. That the Lord said that I'm sowing good seed, I'm sowing good word, and I'm sowing good people. Because you know there's some people that God brought in your life that haven't been nothing but a blessing to your life from the day you met them. That's from the Lord. Because my pastor just said God gives good gifts. That's right. God gives good gifts. That's from the Lord. But mixed in, <laughs> mixed in with your experience is some folks that's so full of the devil, you can't believe they would have the nerve to call themselves a Christian and be in the house of God and act like that. And when you see it, you're like, what the world? But the Lord said his kingdom is like that. That while we sleeping, while everybody was sleeping, the devil come and sow weeds among the wheat. And that's why you are always going to find some people like that among the saints. Because the Lord said his kingdom is like that. So I say that to you to not to help you to not be surprised or discouraged. Don't let yourself get discouraged when you discover the truth of this parable, that there's weeds among the wheat, that there's tares among the wheat, because the Lord said it's like that. And the Lord said what's going to happen is he's eventually going to send some angels to judge that whole thing, and he's going to separate. He's going to separate. He's going to separate. The weeds going to get tied up, and they're going to be burned in bundles, and the Lord's going to gather, gather the wheat into his barn. OK, so when I first read that, I said, well, Lord, I just want to be a wheat. <laughs> I just said, I just want to be a wheat. If that's the fate of the weeds and the tears, I don't, don't want to be that. I don't want to be somebody that looks safe on the top. But the devil's in my heart. So purge me, prune me, get anything out of me that offends you, that's not like you. So that when harvest comes and it's time to separate, I'm with the wheat and I get gathered into your barn because that's where I want to be. You see what I mean? I don't, mm -mm. So that's what I mean when I say, so I don't want you to be discouraged. I want you to be encouraged. This is a part of the process because the Lord said it was. Now do you see why we need to preach and teach the kingdom of God? Now do you see why we need to preach and teach the kingdom of heaven? Because it's what the Lord taught. So now the next time you're in any kind of situation with a whole bunch of people that say they saved, the next time you see some people that just look saved on the top, but they full of the devil, you understand that the Lord already told you that that happens in his kingdom. And don't worry about it because it's not harvest time yet. Don't worry about it because he's not worried about it because he said, let them grow together. The Lord said, if I send angels down there to judge, they might mess up the saints. Or, so don't worry about it. And when judgment time comes, I'm going to separate first. You see that? Does that make sense now? And again, last thing I'm going to say, and then we're going to move to the next section is, that's another reason why, you know, you want to be loving and you want to be kind, but you got to watch who you fellowship with. Because I don't want none of what the weeds and the tears are into to get on me. Because, <clears throat> understand this very uh, specifically. Whatever you're into, there's a spirit behind that thing. There's a spirit involved with it. Because there's a natural component that you see out here on the outside with these, but there's a spiritual component that you have to see with the eyes of faith. 
whenever you get involved with someone, whenever you be are around someone, you start to pick up a little bit on their spirit. How do we know that's true? Haven't you ever noticed that when you hang around with your best friend, y'all start using each other's phrases? <laughs> because your best friend got some catchphrases. They got some stuff they say all the time. And if you hang around them long enough, you find you start saying it too. Your pastor, your apostle, your prophet, the spiritual leader of your church, you notice they got some catchphrases. And when they preach and when they prophesy, there's some stuff they say all the time. And you'll notice after a while, after you've been sitting underneath their ministry, you start saying it too. Uh, your spouse. Uh, if you're married, if you've been married any length of time, after a while, they say y'all start to look alike. And after a while, you notice you can finish each other's sentences because you know what they're going to say before they say it. And after a while, your spouse got some catchphrases. Your spouse got some stuff they say all the time. And then you start saying it. And then your kids say it. Do you know why? Because you start picking up the spirit of whatever you hang around. So that's why you've got to be careful uh, about who you fellowship with. That's why I tell you all the time, uh, do the test of a prophet on me because the Bible says if what the prophet says doesn't come to pass, he's spoken presumptuously, don't listen to him. Because I don't care if you test me, test what I say because that's what the Bible says and I'm submitted to the Bible. I say, yes, Jesus. The Bible said this is how you test a prophet. Does his word come to pass? Does life bear it out? Does life show you? Does it happen like they said? That's how you test a prophet. That's why you don't have to be taken advantage of by people that say they are prophets. Test their word. I tell that to my own kids. I said, test my word. Test dad's word. You don't have to take it just because I said it. Test it. And see if it don't happen just like I said it was going to happen. And every time, every time. So that's what I mean when I say you got to be careful who you fellowship with because now that we know that there are weeds and now that we know that there are, you know, all that false grain among the saints. You know, you got to be careful who you fellowship with because you hang around people long enough, they're going to they gonna breathe what they're into onto you. And so who you want to hang around is people that are increasing your anointing. Who you want to hang around are people that see the best in you and bring the best out of you. When they see you, they got something good to say. When they see you, they're edifying in some way. You feel better after being around them, you, you, because of their influence, you have become more godly. That's who you want to hang around. People that, that God is using to bring the Christ in you out. That's who you want to hang around. But there are them other folks, you know, love people and be kind, but you can't be staying in the vicinity of the weeds. You can't be hanging around with people like that because eventually they're going to pull you into what they into. Okay? And I don't want to be into anything that the Lord don't want me in. Okay? Because I understand how spiritual things work. And if you hang around something long enough, it's going to get in you. It's going to get breathed on you. And then it becomes a part of you. Okay? That's why, that's why parents, as parents, we always seem to be so surprised when our kids act just like us. Where do you think they got all that from? If you say stuff you shouldn't say around your kids, but you say it in private, your kids are going to be somewhere in the grocery store and they're going to bust it out. And they're going to say what you said. Hey, mommy, isn't that Mrs. Johnson, the one you said was fat? <laughs> hey, mommy, isn't that, isn't that Brother Thompson, the one you said you hated? <laughs> it's not funny. But you know the kids do that. You know why they do that? Because kids don't have any discretion. They don't have any social skills with kids. Whatever come up, come out. They heard you say that. You on the phone gossiping about some folks and you do it in the private, but your kids heard you say that. They're going to wait till you get somewhere in public and it's coming out. By that flip, if your kids see you do something righteous, they're going to go somewhere in public and then their faith going to come out. I've seen that too. If your kids see you have faith at home, then they're going to have faith in public because they saw you do it. See what I mean? So that's why if you're going to be a wheat, be a wheat. <laughs> be a wheat all the way and hang around other wheat so you can absorb that anointing and so you can be edified. Don't be hanging around the weeds. Because you don't want none of that to get on you or your family. Do you see what I mean? All right. Amen. If you have any prayer requests, put them on the screen. Uh, and I'll pray for them right now. Now, if I don't pray for them, it's only because I didn't see them. Because I can't see everything that's scrolling on either Facebook or Periscope all at once. So put it on the screen. And if I don't get to it, then when I get off the broadcast, I'll pray for it. But I will pray if you put the request on the screen. Okay? Remember, I told you when we get to this portion of the program, 
When you see me close my eyes and speak in tongues, I'm asking the Holy Ghost, is there a need for physical healing? Is there a need for deliverance? Do we need any spirits broken? Is there a financial word? Is there any other prophetic words he wants me to give? Okay? So here we go. Okay. Okay. The Lord said he wants me to release a blessing. So all of you that are watching me live, all of you that watch my channels, Facebook Live, uh, Periscope and YouTube, and all of you that financially support my ministry. Okay, I see that. I need a prayer for a house to rent. Okay. All right. Let me, let me release this blessing. I'm going to get back to that prayer for a house to rent. The Lord said that I'm releasing a blessing on you that the prophetic word is a blessing to you, that you're going to grow and that you're going to be edified, that you're going to move into prosperity, that you're going to move into the promised land. You're going to move into all that God wants you to have because you've been breathing in the prophetic word. So the blessing of the Lord be upon you, that you might grow and become all that Christ wants you to be, and that you might capture all the ground that God wants you to capture in your life, that you might make all the money God wants you to make, that you might walk in divine healing. Amen, Shalisha, God bless you, first timer, that you might walk in divine healing, that you might find the right person to marry, and that you might, you might have a good and fruitful and Christ-like marriage, that you might find the right career, the thing that God wants you to do, that, that the blessing of the Lord be upon you because you have breathed in the prophetic word. That's what the Holy Ghost told me to say, to release that blessing. So in the name of Jesus Christ, of Nazareth, the son of the true and living God, I release that blessing upon you. It may be upon you, may you receive it, breathe it in, and grow and prosper in Jesus Christ. Now I need to pray for the sister who asked for a prayer for a house to rent. Father, in the name of Jesus, you know the situation. I ask you to open doors because the scripture says, you are he that openeth and no man shutteth, and he that shutteth and no man openeth. And open doors for her to find a house to rent right now, God, because you know we ask, you answer right now at once, okay? So right now, oh God, show her. Yeah, see, I see it falling in the spirit. Show her right now, oh God, the house that you have already reserved and made available for her to get to the rent. Okay, sister, the Lord is also telling me he's been trying to get your attention. And he's trying to get your attention because he's trying to guide you into a more perfect place in his will. So not only ask for the house to rent, don't just ask for that, but hear what the Lord is saying to you about the other things he's trying to do in your life, because that's what's going on in your life. Okay? All right. Amen and amen. All right. Any other prayer requests before we sign off? I feel, uh, I just feel blessed by releasing that blessing. Amen. Because that means good things are happening, man. That means we're growing. That means we're moving in the right direction. That means that the good shepherd, that means that the king of kings is pleased. And we want to keep going in that direction. That's a good sign. Because you don't want to, okay, Shalisha, pray for you for what? Be specific. Because you don't want, you don't want the Lord to have to release judgment. Ooh, I, so, yes, yeah, Shalisha, tell me uh, particularly what you want prayer for. For stronger wisdom. All right? Father, in the name of Jesus, I come to you on behalf of my sister Shalisha, oh God, that you would, your word says that if any man lack wisdom, let him ask from God who gives to all men liberally and doesn't hold back. So I ask you to give her a spirit of wisdom, oh God. Give her the wisdom that you have in reserve for her. Open her mind, open her heart, open her spirit. Open her inner man, her inner self, oh God, that you can pour that wisdom into her and help her to receive it and begin to walk in it and believe it. In the name of Jesus, we pray, amen. Okay, Shalisha, that dropped when I said it. What you have to do now is you have to start saying it. You have to start saying, the wisdom of God is in me. So when you, when you get ready to make a decision, say, the wisdom of God is in me. When you get ready to take some kind of direction, say the wisdom of God is in me. And you'll see the spirit of God and the wisdom begin to activate inside of you, but you have to say it. You've got to release it with your words and you've got to believe it as you confess it. And when you believe it as you confess it, you'll feel the Holy Ghost begin to rise up in you and the wisdom will come forth. Okay? Because remember, y'all, God answers right now. Okay? You pray to God. Amen. Hey, Victoria, God bless you. Blessings to you. You pray to God, that answer is going to drop right now. Okay? All right.
Okay, any other prayer requests before we sign off? God bless all of you that tuned in live. And then remember, you can watch the replay on Facebook Live and Periscope and my YouTube channel as well. And I'll put all those links on Facebook Live. And then some of you have asked to support my ministry financially. And I really appreciate that. I've told you about my project, Meet in My House, where uh, I want to set up some things where we can minister to the homeless, get them some food, and then prophesy to them. Um, and so, yeah, so if you want to support uh, me financially, I have a uh, Zelle and I have a cash app as well. So I put that stuff out there and then, uh, got some exciting stuff coming up in terms of ministry tools. Cause I actually have some material that I've uh, written and some revelations. God has given me some teachings that you're going to be able to get in a book form and audio book form and all that, as well as some of the teachings I put on this channel. So all that's coming up. Um, so yeah, so definitely stay tuned. And I will let you know when this stuff like that is becoming available. Okay? All right. So this was part three of the No More Genie series, We Do It Wrong. Please pray for further direction and revelation from God for my youth ministry. All right, Victoria. In the name of Jesus, Father, we come before you for Victoria. We pray for further direction that you give her the revelation you want her to have about which way you want her to go so she can line up with the perfect will of God and be perfectly centered in your will and find her space in the body of Christ. And then we pray for that youth ministry, oh God, that, that your will will be done, that the kids you want to be under her leadership, that you bring them to her, that you cause her to mentor them, that you cause her to breathe wisdom out upon them, that she brings deliverance to cast out demons and unclean spirits and to break any stronghold of devil, that she brings tongues, that she brings healing, that she brings the full package to the young people so they, so they grow up knowing you in the fullness, not just forgiveness of sins, but healing, deliverance, tongues, prosperity. Oh God, be upon Victoria and all the children, the youth that she ministers to right now in Jesus' name. We thank you for, for it, Father. Amen. Amen and amen. Amen and amen. All right, y'all. So yeah, this was No More Genies uh, Part 3 of We Do It Wrong. And I really strongly, strongly encourage you to go back and look at the whole thing because I break it down... Um, I break it down teaching by teaching. So I will be back with this teaching in September because I come on the first, uh, excuse me, the second Thursday of every month. So this is the second Thursday of August, the 8th. That's why I'm on here live on Thursday. I will be back on September 12th. Now, if you want to catch me on the weekly, I am on at uh, Sunday, 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time every Sunday with a weekly prophetic word. But that's not this teaching. This is particularly the No More Genies teaching, and that's on the second Thursday of every month at 7 o'clock p.m. So I will be back on with part four of this teaching on Thursday, September 12th at 7 p.m. Central Standard Time. Okay? All right. Thank you so much. God bless. Have a good rest of your evening, and hopefully I'll see everybody on Sunday. Thanks. And remember, let's preach and teach what Jesus preached and taught, the kingdom of God.